Amen. Amen. I think it will come as no surprise to you when I say that I was never the star quarterback of my high school football team. Back then, I remember my father had one moment that gave him a glimmer of hope in my athletic abilities when I told him that I would be playing in Friday night's football game. He was excited until he realized that I meant that I'd be playing my clarinet in the school's pep band. That being said, I did hold my own through high school on the cross country and track teams, and I remember that my least favorite part of being on the cross country team wasn't the five or six mile runs that we had to do. It actually wasn't the running at all. Twice a week, on top of our daily run, the coach would have us also do strength training. This would include some weightlifting, as well as the classic floor exercises like push-ups and sit-ups. I distinctly remember that the worst part of the strength training wasn't the bicep curls or the sit-ups, it was an exercise called the wall sit. Essentially, the coach would have us line up on the wall and sit with our knees bent at a 90 degree angle, almost like you're sitting in a chair. This would be for a duration of anywhere from 30 seconds if he was in a good mood, or many minutes if he had an ax to grind with us. What always struck me about the wall sit was how it felt like one of the most grueling parts of our training. Even more grueling than running six miles, or more grueling than curling heavy dumbbells. And yet, the task was essentially to do nothing. Doing nothing took a lot of work. Sitting up against the wall and not moving a muscle took more effort than many exercises that require your full range of motion and get your heart rate much higher. Simply not moving, simply holding yourself up on that wall, took an enormous amount of effort and core strength. How could doing nothing be so exhausting? This exercise, the wall sit, demonstrates a peculiar feature of life, that to achieve stability, to go nowhere at all, to simply exist as you are, requires an incredible amount of energy and resources. It's like when you're at the beach and there's a very strong current. If you don't put any effort in at all, you'll wind up drifting away. So in order to stay in the same place if you're in the water, you need to invest an incredible amount of energy swimming in the opposite direction. Our bodies are doing this constantly. They're constantly maintaining homeostasis, constantly working against the elements to keep things in balance. For example, our bodies maintain a very stable internal temperature within a very small margin of 98.6 degrees, even through a wide variety of external temperatures during both the summer and the winter months. And they do this by constantly creating and expelling incredible amounts of heat. Stability is expensive. Another example of this is that in order for us to maintain a constant body weight, our bodies require the input of many pounds of food and water on a weekly basis. We need to consume thousands of calories daily, not in order to grow, but simply to maintain our body weight. I know that this may seem counterintuitive when most of us are in the process of trying to lose weight more often than put it on, but it's striking how many resources how many thousands of calories it takes on a daily basis to simply stay the same. Whereas a boulder requires zero inputs in order for it to maintain its size and its shape over thousands, if not um, tens of thousands of years, as living creatures, 
It takes an enormous amount of energy on a regular basis to simply keep us at baseline. And in today's Gospel reading, Christ acknowledges this critical importance of sustenance in order to preserve life at a seemingly odd and maybe even an inappropriate time. Christ had been called to go to the house of Jairus, who was one of the rulers in the synagogue. And he was called there in order to heal his 12-year-old daughter, who was very sick. As they were on their way to the house, they were informed that she had already died. Christ boldly responds to hearing this news by saying, Do not fear, only believe, and she shall be well. And after coming to the house, Christ calls the girl by her name and says, Child, arise. And immediately, she stood up. One might rightfully assume that this is the end of the story, that the child rises from the dead, she's reunited with her father, and they lived happily ever after. And yet, after this quite dramatic, shocking, and supernatural feat, Christ does one more thing that seems rather anticlimactic. He asks those in the household to give her something to eat. Christ had just raised this girl from the dead, and he seems more concerned with whether or not she missed lunch. It seems silly to think that the story would end in this way, and yet, this ending is key to understanding its meaning. Christ's role in the story was to come and to restore this girl to life. But he wasn't the only person in the story who had a role to play. Once Christ had raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, it was her family's responsibility to maintain that life, to feed her, to care for her physical needs, to sustain her. Christ gave the gift of life to this girl, but there was a catch. Her family was called to be a, car a partner in Christ's work, to participate in his miraculous action, to affirm what Christ had already done by helping to maintain it. The miracle of raising this girl from the dead would only have meaning if they made the choice to preserve it. And as partners with Christ, her family would be the ones to help sustain the miracle that Christ had produced. This is the nature of how God works in our lives. On the most basic level, God gives us the gift of physical life without us having any say in the matter. It's a free gift that's given to us whether we like it or not. And yet, as we grow and we become independent, we are given the choice of whether or not to maintain this gift, to take care of the lives that we were given. We can make the choice to extend both the quality and the length of our lives by the ways that we choose to nourish them, through diet and exercise and other lifestyle choices. God gives us the miracle of life, but he also gives us the choice of whether or not we want to accept it by wisely maintaining this gift. The same is true with our spiritual lives. We receive the gift of eternal life through our baptism which for most of us is a moment that we can't even remember. Just as Christ raised Jairus' daughter from physical death to physical life, during our baptisms, Christ raises up, us up from spiritual death to spiritual life. And after being raised out of the holy font, Christ gives us a similar instruction, very similar to the instruction that we heard after he had raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He calls those around the newly baptized child to give him something to eat, to nourish his spiritual life, 
until he is able to do so on his own. We nourish our spiritual life through our parents when we're younger and by our own choices as we get older, primarily in the spiritual meal that we are all gathered to participate in this morning. The Surp Badarak, the Holy Sacrifice, where Christ comes to give himself to us as food. There is no such thing as being a Christian and not coming on a regular basis to receive Holy Communion. It doesn't exist. The primary instruction that Christ gives us is to come to the Holy Cup on a weekly basis and to receive of this life-giving, nourishing food. He gives us nourishment during the Badarak in two primary ways. First, through his word, as we heard in the reading of sacred scriptures. But secondarily, through his very body and blood in Holy Communion. By coming to church every Sunday and receiving both the Gospel and Holy Communion, we are making the choice to feed our souls with the food that they were designed to ingest, with the food that is unity with God himself. Sometimes, sadly, we make the mistake of thinking that being a good Christian simply means coloring within the lines. As long as we don't lie or steal or cheat, as long as we're good little boys and girls, we can do whatever we want in this life and it's all okay. As long as we don't yell or exploit or kill, we'll be good with God and he'll let us into heaven. Essentially, we seem to think that the best way to get into heaven is simply to do nothing at all. What we fail to recognize is that Christianity is an active process. Maintaining our spiritual health requires daily care. We must be constantly nourishing our faith, deepening our prayer lives, exploring parts of the Bible that we aren't familiar with, reaching out to others that we don't know, caring for others in new ways that we've never done before. If we are not actively engaged in this process, even if we aren't sinning in any particularly scandalous way, even if we think that we're decent people living decent lives, if we aren't regularly and consciously working to nourish our relationship with Christ, we will inadvertently be moving closer and closer to spiritual starvation and eventually spiritual death. Living life as an Orthodox Christian is like a wall sit. From the outside, it may seem as if we're simply the same, blindly propagating traditions of the past, that we're really doing nothing at all, that we aren't moving with the times, that we aren't evolving. Yet the reality is precisely the opposite. It's following the trends of the times that's easy. It's allowing their wake to take us out to sea that's easy. It's effortless to just go where the wind blows, to just do what feels good, to throw out long enduring traditions and perspectives if they don't immediately make sense to us or conform to how we want to live our lives. The real challenge, the most grueling work, is to change ourselves in order to be a part of God's kingdom. To resist following the societal changes that take place just for change's sake. To strengthen our spiritual muscles to fight against what's easy and to fight against what's simply just in vogue today and later will be out of style in order to choose rather something greater. Our active participation in the full life of the church, which extends, by the way, beyond this parish and beyond this particular time in history, this is what will allow us to maintain homeostasis within the body of Christ. The stability of our church takes hard work. 
The nourishment of our souls is an active process. While from the outside it may seem as if we're doing nothing to others, that we're stuck in the past and inflexible to change, the wall sit of maintaining the Orthodox faith and living it authentically in our lives daily takes an incredible amount of effort. And it will evoke immense resistance at the cores of our beings from the outside world. But ultimately, it will give us the strength that we need in order to enter into a real and authentic relationship with our Lord and Creator. I pray that each one of us work to maintain stability in our own spiritual journeys by actively nourishing our souls daily through the reading of sacred scripture, through engaging in real, authentic prayer, through seeking out those in need of our care and serving them in charitable deeds, and by, on a weekly basis, coming together in corporate worship and approaching the cup of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has come to give of himself as our food. And in doing this, we will indeed fulfill Christ's call to sustain the spiritual life that he instilled within us through our baptisms, a life that will continue unto eternity when we will offer constant praise and worship to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen.